Hello from your friends at Smile. This is Most Clicked, a podcast about digital marketing in the higher education sector. I'm your host, Nathan from Smile. I'm joined by co-founder also from Smile, Matt Lees, and bringing you some additional insights, our long-standing collaborator, Kyle Campbell from The Education Marketer. Now, this week, uh, we are talking about the future of higher education. There's been a very interesting, um, very interesting article written by JISC about digital transformation and how things might change. Uh, Matt, have you got any initial thoughts on, on this one? Uh, yeah, there's there's one piece that stands out to me, and it, it kind of talks about... Um, uh, the, the, the future of of the academic year and uh in the article it states that uh there's this this desire and, and hope that the universities will will move away from the academic year and give students more flexibility to to build a degree out of modules that that suits them uh, and i thought it was quite interesting just before we came on we were talking about uh how that kind of aligns somewhat with the american model for for how they run their degrees feels to me more like it's not a question of if it can be done. I mean, clearly it could be done, shifting the academic year. It's, w will it be done for a whole host of other reasons, tradition, uh, feasibility, mm -hmm. policy change? Like, it, it does make sense to me for a ton of reasons, but I, I don't know, I, I struggle to see it happening anytime soon i think certainly moving the the academic year feels ambitious to me i, I really like the idea of being able to pick and choose modules and shape a degree around your specialism and uh, we were just saying before we joined now that our degrees were somewhat like that in in our first year we did uh kind of taster sessions of of sub modules and then from year two we chose our specialism and that was our focus then for the for the next two years so i, I really like the idea of that but i'm not sure we'd be able to move the the dates drastically i, I feel like i've seen courses that you know, i agree with you like our, our, our course was like that um but I feel like I've seen other universities, albeit on a smaller scale, where you kind of have the ability to pick and choose your modules. So um, I'm sure it's like a mini MBA or something. I can't, I can't for the life of me remember who did it. But I'm sure you could pick and choose your own modules to create your own degree. But it, it seems to me that, that there's a lot of talk about focusing on skills rather than um careers or, or, mm. or things like that and it seems to me that that's a really good fit with that sort of thing um and certainly I, I'd, I'd love to see i'd love to see a university website where you didn't say i want to do maths but you actually just kind of went through a i don't know build a process where you picked the modules and you kind of you get a degree at the end of it i, I don't know how any of this would work it just seems like a really cool idea to me on the um on the skills angle you are you are right there's more emphasis on now the, the skills attained and the, the education per se um there's some really interesting stuff happening in the states right now with um uh, google extending its education program so you'll know like i think it was about a couple of years ago now they released those ux qualifications that were built oh, yeah, in the partnership yeah. industry so now um they're moving to phase two where they they partner with universities to to deliver um qualifications short short form qualifications in skills areas that are in high demand so they're kind of similar to um uk degree apprenticeships in that regard you build the the degree for the the area that that needs it um but they're designed for um young young adults um working working young adults and they they're typically five month qualifications um and even though they're delivered in partnership with a university they cost a, a fraction um of, of the cost of a full degree they're like 50 50 a month for a subscription based model um and you know this this is like a small small sort of play right it's nipping at the heels of the kind of bigger campus degrees but you can see how something like that can be you know very 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 compelling to like someone who perhaps wants to get a skill work and then have something that's that's of value um and i like your 
your sort of take on the American sort of liberal arts model as well. I mean, it's no strange. I'm a massive fan of the humanities, right? Um, and, you know, I feel if we think about the future and foundations and things like that, the, it makes sense to kind of get like a business qualification because you get quite a quick return on your investment. Mm. But increasingly, there's there's more data to suggest that actually if you get a humanities or social sciences or something that's a bit more in the liberal sort of arts sort of area, you, you earn more over a longer period of time. You have a, a you know, a different type of career. And, you know, I think there's a lot to be said about the kind of foundational skills that you, you get with that sort of qualification, not the direct, the, not the directly applicable stuff that goes out of date, but the stuff that sticks with you and helps you make, you know, better critical decisions throughout your life and things. I know it's quite vague, but I, I think there's, there's something in that for sure. I mean, uh, over and above the, the people problem, you know, of, of changing this, there's some quite, big scary phrases in this report and i mean big and scary mainly to like executives i i assume but a lot of use of the word rethink rebuild (laughs) um like there's a section in it called rethink the it department which i don't assume is something that universities want to hear but not only have you got to rethink the it department you've got to make sure the executive team is digitally savvy don't folk, but you know, f- fix the plumbing. There's there's a lot of stuff in here about um, where is it now? Uh, digital transformation about how just the the fundamentals of making sure that your systems are accessible. Do mm. all of your students have access to them? Do they have devices? And I think this is a lot the base level stuff that we we take for granted a lot of the time. But um, they, they, in this report, the part of the rethinking stuff is around that access remotely should be just as good as yeah. access physically. Yeah, and it feels for me that we had a real opportunity to explore that properly with COVID. And yet, now that COVID is, well, I don't know, on the way out, I don't know what the, the right <laughs> turn of phrase is here, really, but it feels like we're definitely past uh, the, the heady lockdown days. And since then, it, it just feels like we've turned our back on that, really, and that remote is a second-class citizen. Mm. It's not a first-class citizen. And there's reasons over and above global pandemics that remote access should be seen as more than that second class citizen so there's there's certainly lots of um lots of room for consideration i i think in this and you know back at a marketing angle you know we've done loads of stuff in like online event arenas and stuff like that and and again we've seen a massive nosedive Mm. in terms of the desire from institutions for that but we haven't necessarily seen a nosedive in desire from prospects and there is this mismatch i think between institution and prospect that needs to be addressed so that the future of higher ed can exist in the format that at least uh jisk have written about in this article i think you're you're bang on there with the with the digital angle and now on on the marketing side the one thing i would add to that is to say all these these digital tools and things that we I think some people have put to the to the side, and I agree with you on that. They're missing out on the the great benefit of scale, right? So mm-hmm. you know, running these open programs, especially if you you're doing a fantastic um, high production quality virtual open day where you've got like studio spaces and you're you know you're producing it like a proper proper piece, you can reach so many more people, and then you've you've got the added benefit of then having all that material recorded that you can then repurpose to continue to connect with people who weren't actually at the event, you know? So if you, if you just do it in person, you don't capture that mm. and have it available yeah. and repurpose it for different social channels. You, you're just leaving so much potential on the table of events that you would have ran anyway, you, you know? So yeah, it, uh, hopefully. I think it, it extends into all forms of education. Like, mm. okay, my daughter is at primary school. It's not quite university level, but if my daughter is ill, Google Classroom's there. Mm. Why does she have to miss out on the yeah, lessons yeah, yeah. that happen there? Um, so, uh, you know, the, I, I think for me, 
the takeaway this week is to to look at those digital channels. I certainly read this piece by uh, Sarah Knight on GISC. We'll put the, the link in the show notes. It's very, very thought-provoking. And, and consider how you could um, increase the priority of your digital channels in terms of delivery, I think. Um, because it's not just about educational delivery. I think there's there's very real marketing advantages in, in that too, and uh, quite possibly to, to gain a bit of a niche in the market right now. Well, thanks very much to both of you. Um, I'll see you on the next one. Thank you to all of our subscribers. Um, we, we love you very much. If you've enjoyed today's chat, please consider dropping us a like. Um, if you are from JISC, we'd love to see you in the comments. Otherwise, until next time, have a good one.